morning, everyone, and welcome to MindSpeak. It's a real pleasure to have Bob back after a very long time. I was looking at uh, my old MindSpeaks, and I think, Bob, the last time we had you, we were in Westgate. It's been a long absence and long overdue, and I'm really pleased to have Bob here. I was thinking yesterday night, you know, do I read out Bob's CV? And I thought, no, I won't. I'm going to talk a little bit about Mr. Collymore and my impressions of him. And sometimes people don't, you know, don't pick up. So let me just put out some things. Uh, you know, Bob, you might see Bob here as a CEO of a $7 billion company. Eight. Eight billion. <laughs> it's <laughs> eight billion dollar company. Built it from a company that was at one time, I think when he came in, was about one point something billion. If you look at that expansion, it is in the top I, I kept saying one percentile, but I've now realized it's in the top 0.5 percentile in the world over that period. It's really an extraordinary performance, and that's the first thing I'd like to say. The second thing is that, you know, I know a little bit about Bob. Bob comes from a very humble background. You know, Bob used to go to the, to the toilet they had was an outdoor toilet when he was a young boy. And his journey, so I'm serious, so, so, when we're, so when we're seeing the CEO of an $8 billion company, we're also seeing somebody who's come from far, far away and is an incredible achievement. And that, what I like about that is that, you know, Muhammad Ali had a quote, impossible is nothing. And I'd like to believe that MindSpeak is about that. It's about the po open possibilities, the possibilities for everybody in this room. And it, I think Bob epitomizes that exact point. There are many other things I could say about Bob, but I think you know he's going to today, I heard this, I was yesterday, I was going through the presentation, and it's such a powerful and interesting presentation. It's slightly off what we normally would, would get to hear about Safaricom. But really, f f from my point of view, it's a privilege to have you to here today, Bob. It's a privilege to call you my friend. And it's a privilege to see friends that I also call friends in the audience, Joshua, Bharat, Ahmed, lots of people here. We're waiting for Lamin, who's coming as well. And all of you in this audience who've made MindSpeak what it is. I'm deeply grateful. On that note, I'm going to open the floor to Mr. Bob Collymore, the CEO of Safaricom, and in the top 0.5 percentile of the world. Actually, can I just do two little stories that I've written? I was sitting at a conference in London at the FT conference, and on my left was Cherie Blair. And uh, I, I, it's, 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 uh, Bob came in. And, uh, I was watching how Cherie and Bob were reacting. And he was, hi, Bob. And I said to Bob, Bob, you're playing at a level I never knew you were playing at before. <laughs> That's definitely Bob Collymore. He's, he's, he's navigated the world. He's thinking about things which I think a lot of us should be thinking about. And at the end of the day, a performance that he has delivered in so many different ways. And you know, I was going through the sustainability report of Safaricom again. And I'm thinking, you know, what a huge impact. In that report, KPMG have calculated Safaricom's impact is about 11 times their profit in terms of our society. The number of jobs that they have created in a primary and in a secondary manner, clock just under a million. And if you look at all of that, you really know that there's been a phenomenal impact that Bob Collymore and Safaricom and the employees at Safaricom have made. We're sitting here, by the way, the internet access is karibu.net, karibu.net, um, in small letters. But I remember paying thousands of dollars to get my internet connection 10 years ago. Today, we're all on smartphones, we're all communicating. And really, a lot of that is down to the business that Bob is running and has run so successfully. Mr. Collymore. This morning, I thought I would talk to you about the economics behind data pricing. But then my wife said, don't be silly. <laughs> so, so we're not going to do that. When, uh, when Ali Khan approached me uh, a few weeks ago, I think it was when we did the results announcement, and I said, not again, you know, I've done two of these. Um, and so, 
you know, we had just finished a conversation talking about some of the significant shifts that we're seeing in the world's economy today. A dominant few are increasingly owning more and more of the world's resources, creating the basis for what is already the most unequal society in the world's history. We've seen the rise of the demagogue in countries like the Philippines and now even America. And these forces will shape our future in ways that we've never before imagined. In fact, they could influence our very evolution, which is why we've called this the evolution of hope. But before we talk about some of the forces that are influencing us today, allow me to take you back in time to a period when there was a single group that dominated the earth. These individuals were at the very top of the food chain. And they're the most deadly of predators. <clears throat> they acted only in their own interest. I seem to be surrounded by bankers today. I'm not sure why. Welcome, Lemon. But yet years into their dominant existence, they were swept away by an evolutionary event that they never actually saw coming. What killed them is still the subject of some scientific debate. Uh, some scientists posited that it could have been a volcanic explosion somewhere in the Siberian area, which blasted carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Others suggested that it might have been caused by an impact from a meteor. Whatever it was, ocean anoxia, which is the lowering of oxygen in the, uh, in the oceans, could have been another reason, or indeed, even a combination of many of those things. It was a perfect storm that led to a natural catastrophe. Life, as the leaders of the world knew it at the time, ended in a wisp of noxious gases. People call this evolutionary event the great dying, and I prefer to look at it as an evolution of nature against the dominant life form. Similar evolutions have continued to shape our history as, as a planet in 542 million years since the era of that early dominant civilization who were known as the Trilobites. Now, one major evolutionary event started unfolding in 1764 when manufacturing moved out of the cottages into the cities. It's always interesting to listen to other people's ringtone, Lamina. <laughs> <clears throat> and at that point, you know, work became mechanized. So instead of being an artisan, doing your stuff in the cottage industries, work moved into a more mechanized phase, creating a shift to powered, special purpose machinery, factories and mass production. Industries across the world, as we knew it, was transformed radically. Countries started to be defined by their industrial power. And in 1712, an Englishman was called Thomas Newcomen developed the first practical steam engine. At first, the engine was used to pump water out of the mines, but by the late 1770s, James Watt defined, redefined the engine, enabling produce to move beyond the borders on locomotives and then later by steamships. Again, a dominant class emerged, giving those with money and power to create new products and to conquer the world of food production, of transportation, finance, new power. The second industrial revolution, beginning in the mid-19th century, introduced electric power, steel, chemicals, petroleum, and industrial mass production processes. The catalyst for the next phase of the world evolution came from a gentleman known as Henry Bessemer, who invented the converter in 1856. It was cheap and easy to produce, and it allowed large-scale metalwork to merge with electrical advances to create what many of us now know as industry today. The production line began to define the growth of industries with economic output that rivaled that of their home countries. But once again, as we evolved, we left behind those 
who didn't have access to innovations. Now, the origin of another new evolution started once a new word came into existence. Actually, this was way back in 1613. The word computer is not a new word. It was originally used to describe a human being who performed calculations. The definition of a computer remained very much the same until the end of the 19th century when the Industrial Revolution gave rise to machines whose primary purpose was calculating, analyzing, and automating. The third Industrial Revolution introduced digitization of technology. Now, this is where the story might start to seem a little familiar. I wouldn't bore you with the details, but from the simplest computing machine that printed simple symbols onto paper tape, and uh, as I look around the room, there are at least one or two people who can remember that, Lamin. Right up to today's supercomputers, the evolution of machines is now defining our history. Every day, we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data. Now, for perspective, in 1992, the world was creating 100 gigabytes per day. By 2018, the world was producing 50,000 gigabytes per second. Now, this signals the start of the fourth industrial revolution, which is set to fundamentally shift the way that we work and the way that we play. Technologies such as self-driving cars, artificial intelligence, big data, the internet of things, 3D printing, biotech, and quantum computing. They will all leverage this explosion in data to create the basis of a new way of living. Already, 70% of Americans are now tracking their health using an app. Analysis of this data as it streams through these devices has led to a 20% improvements in patients' mortality. But in this latest evolution, we're already seeing signs of a new dominant species. We've evolved from economies which are bound by walls of our homes to intra-country trade, to our international commerce. We're now a limitless planet tied together by technology. Technology has democratized access to markets in ways never before imagined. Today, with a simple internet connection, a trader in Katui can trade with someone in Australia and vice versa. Logically, then, you'd expect that technology should be the great equalizer of our world needs. Instead, it's creating even deeper divisions between the haves and the have-nots. Today's trilobites can be compared to the Warren Buffets of this world, who are using their old industrial savvy to create new wealth for themselves in the digital age. But while Warren may have taken decades of investor savvy to accumulate his wealth, it's taking entrepreneurs like Mark Zuckerberg who's younger than many of you in this room, significantly less time to amass the same amount of wealth. Uber is but five years old. Airbnb is less. Lyft is less. And these are creating instant billionaires. When I was young, we looked up to millionaires. Today, millionaires don't count. These are the super rich. Established business models are being tested today. As I said, 24 months ago, who in this room would have imagined that Uber, an app which was developed in the United States to hail taxis, would cause riots here in the streets of Nairobi, and indeed in many other streets around the world? We are actually on the brink of an even more unequal world. Five million jobs in the world's leading economies could disappear over the next five years because of advances of technology. The good news is that some of these jobs will be offset by the creation of some 2.1 million new opportunities in sectors such as technology, professional services, and media. 
But where does Africa sit in this story of evolution? Are we equipping our people with the right skills? Or are we force-fitting the mindset of the industrial era which are long gone? The biggest challenge for leadership today is to ensure that the gains that we have made in the last few decades, where we've leapfrogged through the various industrial revolutions, continue to create opportunities for everyone. And actually, nowhere is this more apparent than here in Africa. According to the Brookings Institution, between 1970 and 2013, Africa's share of global manufacturing output fell from 3% to 2%. As a share of sub-Saharan African GDP, manufacturing has shrunk from almost 20% to about half of that. Almost the entire output of the continent today is purely for domestic consumption, not for export. And today, we need to create 3,000 new jobs every day. The population is growing at the rate of a million a year. And so by this time tomorrow, Kenya should have created another 3,000 jobs. And by this time on Monday, it should have created another 3,000 jobs. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't think that we as a continent, and definitely not as a country, are prepared for this evolution. And that's not the only worry. The world is already in the cusp of a second dying, similar to the one that wiped out the civilizations 542 million years ago. Last December in Paris, we all agreed to contain global warming to a maximum of 2 degrees. But see if we can get it close to 1.5 degrees. Anybody knows? what the average temperature of the Earth was last year. It was 1.4 degrees. So between 1820 and last year, it grew. And the whole year, it was an average of 1.5, 1.4. It's estimated that by the year 2050, there will be more plastics in our oceans than there will be fish. It's something worth dwelling on and something certainly worth thinking about as we think about the debate that we've seen earlier this week when the East African Parliament has proposed that we ban plastics. If we don't, that's, and actually, you know, the, the, the plastics in the sea, it ends up in you because it ends up in the fish and you eat the fish. Last year we saw Ebola and this year we saw the Zika virus. It reminded us of how close we are to a global pandemic. And we see a worrying increase in political turbulence here in Africa, in the Middle East, in Eastern Europe. And as we get wealthier, we're actually growing much more divisive. Today, 1% of the world's population has as much wealth as the rest of the world. What this means in real numbers is that six to two people own as much as the poorest half of the world's population, according to, uh, to Oxfam. Uh, and actually, this number has fallen dramatically. In 2010, that number was 388. And last year, it was 80. So the rich, the number of rich, the number of Mark Zuckerbergs are shrinking. But they're, of course, they're getting considerably richer. If you're one of the 7.2 million American men who today are no longer even looking for work. They don't count as being unemployed because they're not in any register. They've simply given up. If you're one of those men who, and I pick on men specifically, who are being asked to pay $1,000 for an iPhone 7 or there or thereabouts. An iPhone 7, as you know, is an American, is an American phone. But it's more cost effective to manufacture that phone in China. So the jobs shift to China. And actually, it's also more cost effective to pay your tax somewhere outside of the United States. You pay it in Ireland. If you're one of those men, do you think they would be asking the question of where did Trump come from? <laughs> we have Lamin in the room, and I'm sure Lamin wouldn't mind me recounting a private conversation we had um, 
uh, maybe nine months ago, I think, at my home. Joshua was there. And Lamin said, Trump will be elected president of the United States. And we all said, don't be crazy. He says, furthermore, you people, the Brits, will vote to exit Europe. And again, we said, you're crazy. Um, he didn't become the CEO for Standard Chartered Bank for no reason. He called it exactly. If you are one of those 7 million men, 7.2 million men, don't you think that you you think that there's something wrong? And all over the world, we're beginning to see a revolt against this privilege. And one of the most visible expressions was in Britain in June last year. I woke up one morning, I actually was in, um, in Valencia, I think. I woke up to the news that Britain had voted to leave the EU. It was a shock to my system. We then, of course, a couple of weeks ago, saw Trump, and this is much more than a revolution against those with money. It's an outcry against the abuse of privilege. And this is what happens when you see the intersection of the decline of income and the decline of hope. This is an aerial view of Kangemi and uh, Kilolesha, right? Loresha. Look at how close it is. Close your eyes for a minute and look at the visual images of the refugees who have been fleeing from places like Syria, North Africa. Look at the risk they take to cross oceans. It's not very difficult to see how easy it is to cross that fence. The only natural outcome that we can see is revolt. It's in our most base nature to fight against inequality. And I'd like to show you a video, if we can make it run, um, which will show you an experiment that was done to show how monkeys actually handle an unfair world. The one on the left is a monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece he eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. <laughs> basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. Franz de Waal, and as he describes it, this is the equivalent of the Wall Street protest. Um, a friend of mine, Giuliani, actually referred to Brexit and Trump as revolution in a developed world. That's how the developed world deals with revolution. It wasn't that the Brits really believed that it was Europe. It wasn't that the Americans really believed in Trump. They just revolted against getting the cucumber. Now, that's how they handle it in the developed world. How do you think they handle it in the undeveloped world? A few years ago, we saw the Arab Spring. And at the time, we thought it was hope spring eternal. But actually, it wasn't. Huh? Look at what happened as a result of the, of the Arab revolt. Look at what's happened to Syria. Look at what's happened to Tunisia to Libya, to Egypt, to Turkey. So the revolt is not necessarily the right thing, but the revolt will come. When we reflect then on what can we, some of the people in the front row, the businesses of this, uh, this world can do about it. Because if you just rely on the revolt, we're likely to end up with the same consequences that we've seen with Arab Spring. 
The privilege of businesses' relationships with governments is what they can use to democratize the benefits that has pre previously been reserved for the few. Businesses traditionally, and I speak in good company with these guys at the front here, um, businesses traditionally, their relationship with government has been that of lobbying. And we've heard Trump talk a lot about this. And once a lot of us said, you know, Trump is an idiot. And of course, Trump is an idiot, actually. But um, <laughs> once we heard him talk about it, there's some stuff that he said which resonated. He talked about the corrupt nature. He talked about draining the swamp. Because, actually, businesses' relationship with government has not been a healthy one. Whenever we interact with governments, we interact to get tax concessions, and we do things like Tim Cook did with Apple. He didn't break the law, actually. Apple didn't break the law. He acted within the law, but did he act morally? And do businesses as a whole, and I speak on behalf of all businesses, businesses as a whole, have they acted with moral courage? I'm pleased to say I speak as representing the company that pays the largest tax bill in East Africa. Businesses need to move beyond growing just shareholder value at the expense of protecting basic human rights and climate degradation. The biggest challenge that you have, actually, is not youth unemployment, although that's the thing that I lose sleep over at night. The biggest challenge we have as a world is climate change. Because, again, if you come back to President-elect Trump, if he really believes that climate change is a hoax, we have a problem because America is the largest polluter in the world. And China, thankfully, have said, whatever happens, we're coming with you. But if America doesn't, we have a huge problem. Social inequalities can be leveraged by successful businesses who want to provide opportunities for disadvantage by developing the right products and services which will help to address those gaps. And we have very many examples in, um, in some of the businesses represented in this room today. More than at any other time in history, businesses have the ability to extend that hope to communities around the world. And Ali Khan asked me what the badge was. It's actually, I wear the badge every day these days. This is the symbol of the Sustainable Development Goals. And these goals, it took a little while for the world to get to, but 194 countries signed up to it last year. And they provide the exact framework for doing that. For once, Businesses have the resources, the people, the ideas that can transform policy into action or exclusiveness into access. We need to form a new compact that's based on our desire to meet these challenges head on and to create the basis for more inclusive growth. Businesses can pursue partnerships with government in a more positive way that can help to drive greater impact than if they try to choose to go it alone. And because of the scope of their accesses, business can also create sustainable solutions that can tackle big issues like reducing inequalities, the eradication of extreme poverty, and of course, climate change. Public-private partnerships and consumer awarenesses are changing the expectations of business and brands. Successful businesses are those that have developed an authentic, and a moral interest in supporting society and future generations. And the objective is simple. Just don't leave anyone behind. At Safaricom, we believe that mobile technology has the ability to drive transformation and transformative change in Kenya and to deliver on critical services. And this is because the traditional infrastructure or government services are still not available to large segments of the population. And this is why we heavily integrate smart technologies into our engagement at community level. Now, what's the outcome of these initiatives? Immediate access and high impact initiatives that create hope for the future. Africa is evolving, but it needs us to evolve, evolve together. Businesses can help to bridge the gaps that our continuing evolution has created. More importantly, we can start to evolve to meet the needs of this new world. But it's not just about businesses. Many of you in this room are from the business community. And some of you may not be. 
you also have a responsibility. Think on those numbers that I talked about a moment ago. One million new jobs, or 3,000 new jobs per day, or 125 new jobs every hour. How do we create that? Many people in this room will say, well, technology gives us the opportunity to do that. Well, here is a startling fact. Whilst the, Americans, the American blue-collar worker in the so-called Rust Belt, and that's an interesting word because we didn't have this word a few years ago. The Rust Belt is that whole area that factories are now rusting. Actually, in Britain we have the same thing, incidentally, because the people who voted to exit Europe were from the old industrial north, not from London. Um, they voted for Trump because they believed that globalization are taking the jobs away. Estimates are that for every five jobs that were lost in America, four of them were lost because of technology. And whenever I listen, and even last night I was uh, moderating a panel at Strathmore, and people talked about the services sector. Well, and I'm sure Lamin and Joshua will forgive me for saying this, but the opportunity of the services sector was demonstrated last week on the front pages of the Business Daily where it was said that a thousand jobs were lost in the banking sector. Actually, wrongfully, in my view, and they might correct me, they said it was because of the interest rate capping. It wasn't because of the interest rate capping. It's because of technology. It's because, you know, Equity Bank have been closing branches because they've been moving to a digital space. Joshua has similarly been moving to a digital space. Lamin, in fact, moved your shared services. Um, so it wasn't about the interest rate capping, which incidentally, I mean, I also happen to think it wasn't a very smart law, but there you go. Um, it was because the digitization of the world is actually taking those jobs away. So when we say the services sector will grow, uh, and I was saying to Kui, the, 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 the photograph that we wanted to show you here is outside what the outside world thinks the services sector is. The services sector is actually car washes. Has anybody noticed the growth of car washes around Nairobi? That's the services sector. When you ask yourself, why is it that Africa has 60% of the remaining world's arable land? The rest of the world, 60% of that is in Africa. Why do we then import 30% of the food that we eat? As I got dressed this morning, I, um, I got changed three times. Because every time I, my wife said, no, you can't wear that. Um, but I tried really hard to wear a Kenyan-made shirt. And she bought me a Ken Kenyan-made shirt earlier this week, last week. Um, because I really wanted to be able to stand on this stage and say I was wearing something Kenyan. Why is it that this jacket can't be made in Kenya? Why can't these shoes be made in Kenya? We don't want to make anything. We want to get into app development. We want to get into the services sector. You know what? You take, forget the banks, look at the insurance companies. We were talking earlier about how do you move insurance onto the mobile phone. Um, so the services sector is not going to be the magical solution. ICT, you know, the way ICT, and I'm breaking off, I'm actually done with the written speech now. So. Um, when I think of how AI, um, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, augmented reality, robotics, nanotechnology, when I look at what's, you know, what, what the real advantages of those things, they're going to help my mom. My mom lives in the, um, the United Kingdom, and she's getting a little old, and robotics will help. Artificial intelligence will help. Actually, she was recently diagnosed with Alzheimer's, so she says, yeah, it's okay, because my phone will remember the numbers. I don't have to remember them anymore. So for an aging population in the developed world, in Europe and the United States, actually technology works for them because it makes life easy for them. We don't have an aging population. We have a population that's getting younger. And we have a population from whom technologies will take work away. So when our young people look for these opportunities, and they all want to become incidentally, I mean, they all want to become Mark Zuckerberg overnight, which um, we all know is not going to happen. Um, we all want to get into the development of apps 
And we all know that the opportunities there are fairly limited. Having said that, you know, we see some pretty smart people. Um, we were, Steve and I were meeting a couple of very bright young women, 25 years old, computer scientists, um, uh, and we were going to be investing in their company. But Africa doesn't want to make stuff. Africa doesn't want to make t-shirts. It irritates the hell out of me when I look, even if you look maybe at the things which are covering this, these chairs and ask where they were made, we don't want to make anything. China did not move 600 million people out of extreme poverty by not making things. I have a friend whose name is Helen Hai. And Helen is the, um, the founder of a thing called Made in Africa. She's Chinese. Uh, she lives in China. And she opened the uh, shoe factory in Ethiopia, creating 8,000 jobs. And Helen said to me, well, you need to understand that China needs to find a home for 8 to 5 million jobs. China needs to find a home for 8 to 5 million jobs. If I was a president of a, an African state, I would just take her arms off. And actually, you know what? There are some presidents and prime ministers who are. So Ethiopia opened their arms and says, come on in, 8,000 jobs. I saw her a few weeks ago in uh, London, I think, and she says, I'm in Rwanda. I'm, I have a garment factory that is now employing 1,000 people. I'm going to meet President Buhari to see what we can do in, Nairobi, in um, Nigeria. We don't want to make things. We don't want to have factory. We don't want to work in factories. And you know what, if we don't work in factories, we're not going to have the jobs. And you know what? If we don't have the jobs, we will have an Arab Spring, not just in Kenya, but across the continent. That is the thing which keeps me awake at night. It's not about whether we make a profit, not about whether we are in the one percentile or the half a percentile. What really, really worries me is the 3,000 jobs that we didn't create yesterday, the 3,000 jobs that we cannot create today. And whichever way you look at it, and I don't want to argue with the statisticians, particularly the government statisticians, but if the population grew by one million last year, let us be generous and say we created 300,000 jobs, which actually we didn't. Let us pretend we created 300,000 jobs. We actually created last year 700,000 unemployed people. We don't have to think very hard about what's going to happen this year. There's another 700,000 people who are going to be unemployed. And next year, it's going to be another 700,000 people. So when you look back at the photograph of Kangemi and Laresha, you ask yourself whether we are in a good place. Ladies and gentlemen, I will close um, and open up the questions. Um, but I want to say this. I want to say that the Sustainable Development Goals actually give us the framework for addressing these. And people say, ah, oh, there's 17 goals, there's 169 targets. Forget about that. It deals with three basic issues. It deals with reducing inequalities. It deals with the eradication of poverty, of extreme poverty. It's not even poverty, it's extreme poverty. And it deals with climate change. These are the three biggest challenges our world faces today. Businesses have to step up. Businesses so far across the world, it's not just Kenya, across the world, we have failed to step up. We have failed to take the moral high ground. We have concentrated primarily on one stakeholder, and that's a shareholder. Governments need to step up. Governments need to get beyond the electoral cycle. And the electoral cycle gets shorter and shorter and shorter. I can tell you, from January the 11th onwards, electioneering in the United States will start. Of course, here in America, in um, which country? Are we in? Kenya. Here in Kenya. We started electioneering back in 2013. And we will start again in September 2017. We need to get over the short electoral cycle. We need to start to take a longer view. Because in Africa, one of the things that we have failed to do for decades, and there are some exceptions, and you know, my big hero in this one, and not my hero in everything, but my big hero in this one, of course, is President Kagame, who does take a world view, knows exactly where he wants his country to be. You might criticize them in some other areas, but I have to say that when you go to Kagami, when you go to Kigali, I was going to say Kagami City, when you go to Kigali, you get a sense of a country that knows where it's going. You, ladies and gentlemen, whether you're running businesses or you're standing here as individuals, you have a vote. Don't blame the politicians because you're the ones that put them there. 
The politicians are actually pretty smart people. President Trump actually is not an idiot. He's a very smart person. You decide who you want to lead you, both as politicians and as business leaders. I'd like to thank you for your very kind attention, and I'd like to take any questions, if there are any. If there are none, then we go ahead.